We thank you so very much for joining us in this worship hour. And I'd like to say that your presence is indeed a blessing to us. We appreciate your support, your prayers, your contribution, your love, and your friendship. This is the place you want to be when you want to hear a word from the Lord. Again, this is the day that the Lord has made. We shall rejoice. We shall be glad in it. Our scripture reading is coming from 1 Samuel, the 16th chapter, verses 14 and 15, verses 19. And then verses 22 to 23. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servant said to him, See now, an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. So Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me your son David, who is with the sheep. Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David remain in my service for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, David took the harp and played it with his hand and Saul would be relieved and feel better and the evil spirit would depart from him. That's the word of God for the people of God. That is an interesting recorded history. We all have our before and after stories that we enjoy sharing. For instance, I recall that a friend of mine told me that before she had her first child, she was actually in a size eight. And after her third child, she had gained over 50 pounds. She made up her mind one day that for the sake of her own health and for the sake of her family that she was going to lose that weight so that she could be in a, a healthy position in life. And she actually lost that weight. The last time I talked with her, she was in fact in a size 10. So she's making lots of progress. So we have her before and her after story. And there was another conversation that I shared with a classmate. And it was stated that before going to college, uh, she was very introverted, withdrawn, shy, totally anti-public speaking. And after taking several challenging, challenging classes in mass communications, she somehow managed to evolve into a motivational speaker and a life coach. Here's another before and after story. The first being that she went from the perfect little size eight, getting overweight in a danger zone with the obesity, got herself all focused, made a great change, lost most of that weight down to a size 10. So that's a great thing, the before and after. The student, once shy, refused the spotlight, now is in the spotlight willingly. We even have some pandemic before and after stories, interestingly. An example of that is that uh, when the reopening uh, took place, I had a friend to share with me that uh, her hair was unmanageable, split ends, faded colors. It was a matted mess. And after her visit to her hair salon, her professional and preferred stylist treated her hair and restored its beauty luster, gave her an excellent cut, and hair was shiny and healthy once again. So that was a before and an after story having to deal with the pandemic. There's another story that even during this pandemic, someone's telling. Uh, a friend of mine shared with me that uh, because of the pandemic, that he'd worked long hours, took work home, and was always chasing to keep up. And since the plant closed down, he has finally, he says, gotten enough time to check off some items on his honeydew list. He's made some major improvements around his home, and he's made his wife and family extremely happy. In fact, he's become their hero, and this makes him extremely happy. So here's another before and after stories. 
You know, we find that the, the father it put so much energy into working before, had no time for family or for chores. And the after part of the story is that he was able to not only spend time with family, but to get chores accomplished. And the family blossomed and became healthier and happier. The title of our message for this morning, mind you, is Before and After. Before and After. We all have before and after stories. We note changes that take place in our lives and we can remember how we once were as to how we are today. We've made such positive improvements that we do not desire to revert back to where we once were. In fact, we wish to continue growing and to increase in our growth. So we are excited about sharing these stories with family and friends and even strangers and making proud statements of self-esteem as we embrace the better improved us. The before and after stories are, in contrast, totally different. There's the side that were negatives that became positives. There was the darkness that became light. There was the weak that became strong. We're talking about before and after. As I was reading our uh, scripture from 1 Samuel 16th chapter, there was some mention there, if you recall, about music. Saul had sent for David, and David played his harp. And as he played it, Saul would be relieved and would feel better. And the evil spirit that tormented him would depart and leave him at peace. There's a such thing referred to as music therapy. Music has its way of calming, of encouraging, of making happy. Let us just answer the question, when was music first used as a method of healing or for therapy? And who was the first to do it? Well, we can clearly see that that happened thousands of years ago during the time of Saul and David. God gave a torment spirit to Saul, part of a judgment. It was, it was noted in the scriptures that, that the author says, see now an evil spirit from God is tormenting you. They could, they could actually see the transition in personality when God took away his peace. And whenever that happened, and David availed himself to play the harp or blow the flute, whatever it might have been, it brought peace. The healing powers of music is great. And as I said, the evidence of it dates all the way back. Dr. David Huron at Ohio State University provides a compelling neurobiological hypothesis on why sad music is soothing. In his studies, he suggests that for some, when listening to sad music, the hormone prolactin is secreted, and that's found in the pituitary gland. The prolactin produces feelings of tranquility and calmness and releases a consoling and soothing effect. So music plays a part. And God was kind enough to give us music. It's God's bright idea. Even when you see a toddler respond to music, it is most amazing that they have no idea what music is. They may be playing or distracted with something, and all of a sudden they hear this music. And you find them responding to the beat, the rhythm, the sounds, the tones, the instruments. And the baby bounces. And even children react with happiness and lively responses. And the same applies to adults. You'll find them patting their foot, clapping their hands, bouncing their shoulders, you know, bouncing their heads, popping their fingers. They are responding to the music because the music seems to bring a change in their inner person. It either takes them to a place of memory 
or it takes them to a, a moment of escape in their mind to whatever scene they want to be in for the moment that they hear the music. Music makes a difference. And I just like to let us know that at one time we hummed, whistled, sang, rambled to ourselves and or baby and children even entertain themselves with little sounds and they gain some degree of comfort from doing it. Now we've heard babies, they're, they're looking at their feet and they're playing with their little toys and they're making all this noise. They're kind of singing, they're kind of talking, they're kind of expressing themselves. And as they grow and develop, we, we all have our, our own little tune. And it may not be as pleasant in the ears to some, but it happens to bring us some degree of comfort. Uh, some people may sew, and as they sew, they're, they're humming, they're singing. It brings some comfort. Some people may be clicking and staring, and they may find them humming and singing. It brings some comfort. Uh, God gave us a beautiful gift when he gave us music. But as we look at that scripture again, 1 Samuel 16, the Holy Spirit departed from Saul. He started out very well as the king. But as time progressed, it, he developed a, a way of disobeying God and his actions derailed what could have been a God honoring rule over the nation of Israel. He could have been an excellent king is the point. But how could someone so close to God at the start of his mission allow himself to, to spiral out of control and out of the favor of God? To understand how things in Saul's life got so mixed up, we need to know something specifically about Paul. Who is this guy, Saul? I said Paul, but I really mean Saul. Who is this guy? Who was King Saul and what can we learn from his life? Ah, the name Saul is from the Hebrew word, meaning to ask. Saul was the son of Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. He came from a wealthy family, and he was tall, dark, and handsome in appearance. And scripture states that there was not a man among the sons of Israel more handsome than Saul. He was a good-looking, very handsome man. And he was God's chosen for the task of being the king. God selected him. He was God's chosen. God's, he picked him out of the crowd, so to speak. And this king was to lead the scattered nations of Israel, a collection of the tribes that did not have a central leader other than God and no formal government. In times of trouble, leaders would arise but never consolidate the power of the 12 tribes into one nation. And years before Saul became king, Samuel the prophet was Israel's religious leader, but not the king. In fact, Israel was loosely ruled by judges who presided over domestic quarrels and, 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 and arguments and, and, and financial resolves, but there wasn't a king. There was no one yet equipped to rule in the times of war. And it's no exaggeration, mind you, when we say that the prophet Samuel and the king Saul lived in turbulent times. The Philistines were Israel's arch enemy, and war broke out between the two of them on a regular basis. Now, this is not a good thing simply because Israel just was not equipped for battle. They were in no way in comparison in terms of artillery and weapons, as were the Philistines. Because of the constant threat of war and desire to be like the surrounding nations, the people pressured the prophet Samuel to appoint a king to rule over them. They insisted on having a king. Now, though the people's request for a king was most displeasing to God, when Samuel presented the proposal to God, God was like, no, I'm their king. But Samuel expressed that these people insist. And God approved it. It's fine if that's what they want. 
The people had rejected God as king, forsaken him, and served other gods. So God told Samuel to anoint a king as the people had asked, but also to warn them what this king will present. So the prophet Samuel goes to the people of Israel and he tells them, if you get this king that you are so insistent on, he will take your sons into battle. He'll put them on the front line. He will take your sons as laborers and put them behind the plow and have them to harvest. He will give them to make weapons of war and to make equipment for chariots. He says, and they'll take your daughters and make them perfumers and cooks and bakers. They will take your fields and your vineyards and your orchards and give them to his friends, give them to his assistants, give them to his servants. He'll take 10% of your grain and of your, of, of your olives and he'll give them to his servants. He'll take your finest of your young men and make them his servants. And the people refused. To allow God to still be in control. Even when they got heads up. They're told in advance what to expect from this king. They still insisted. And God says fine. Now you know what we're learning already is that sometimes God will allow you to have just what you want. Even though it's not the best thing for you. He says he'll give us the desires of our hearts. Should our heart not be in the will of God. That would save us a lot of trouble. But no, Israel wanted this tall, dark, and handsome king, and they got him. Now, here is when we find that the king becomes a little bit uneasy. It's when Goliath confronts Israel, and there's a standoff with the Philistines in the Valley of Elah. Here Goliath taunts his Israelites for 40 days until the shepherd named David kills them. Now this shepherd boy who stands up to Goliath and takes him down and destroys him makes King Saul a little nervous. Isn't that interesting? It's something that he couldn't do and it's something that he did not do. But God sent the anointed one who was David, and the Spirit of God was upon David. And Saul recognized that, and he envied it. He wasn't too happy with that, because he never knew when the time would rise up that the, the people would select David over him. In spite of that, Saul does continue on as king. He was a competent military leader. He was good at his rule and was solidified by the victory at Jabesh Gilead. As part of his triumph, he again proclaimed uh, the king of Gilgad. He went on to lead the nation through several more military victories and his popularity increased. However, a series of blunders began when he made an unauthorized sacrificial offering and that's when he began to really fall, slowly but hard. Saul's downfall from kinship began. He displayed a lack of loyalty to God, and God was not pleased. Saul's downfall sparrow continued as he failed to eliminate all of the Amulekites and their livestock as God had commanded them. God has said, destroy all of their men, all of their women, all of their children, all of their babies. All of their livestock, oxen and sheep, destroy them all. And Saul did not. He destroyed all but one. He maintained the king and he kept the choice livestock. Again, he disobeyed God. God regretted that he had made Saul king. Saul refused to obey God. Now we're learning. We're learning now that when God puts you in a position, he authorizes you to be a success. But your success is contingent on obedience and submission to God. These are God's people. These are not Saul's people. 
And this applies to any king, any leader. God places you in a position to look over and govern his people according to his word. Now, when they become your people, which that will never happen, because you come into this world with nothing, and you'll leave with nothing. This old disobedience was the last straw as God would withdraw his spirit from Saul. The break between God and Saul is perhaps one of the saddest events in the scriptures. It's one of the most saddest dramas when God takes his presence away. While Saul would be allowed to serve out the rest of his life as king, he was plagued by an evil spirit that tormented him and brought about waves of madness. Saul's final years were profoundly tragic as he endured periods of deep mantic depression, which is somewhat similar to being bipolar, mood changes, difficult getting along with people, uh, yells and screams, throwing and ranting and raving and pushing and shoving and being rude and abrupt. However, it was a young man brought to him by the name of David who soothed him with the music, who God gave him some degree of relief. It was a much needed moment in Saul's life when he could get a grip with himself, but only when the anointed one was there to be a blessing to him in music. This is another message to be known. God has people that he sets up to be a blessing to his people, to his leaders, to ease the pain, to, 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 to help carry the weight of things. And David was that type of person at this time. I just like to make mention that David became a block for Saul, and Saul wanted him killed. That's a bad thing. But David managed to succeed in evading and escaping every attempt that Saul made for his life. And that's what God does. He puts you in a powerful position. And if you obey him and his anointing is with you, he protects you from your enemies. You need not worry. He guards and protects. The final years of King Saul's life brought him a general decline in his service to the nation and in his personal fortune. He spent much time and energy and expense trying to kill David rather than trying to rebuild his reputation and to regain the confidence of his nation. That's interesting. When you are, you're so pushed to destroy someone else that you allow your own mission to fail. And then lastly, I'd like to just mention that after the prophet Samuel died, the Philistines army actually overpowered Israel as it had been predicted. And Saul was terrified and he tried to inquire from the Lord of what he should do against this, this battle that he was confronting. But he received no answer from the Lord. The Lord had turned a deaf ear. There comes a time when you disobey God and you mistreat his presence and disrespect his presence. He turns a deaf ear. And this is what has happened. Saul can't hear from the Lord. So, and he had banished, mind you, the mediums and the spiritualists from the land, but Saul disguised himself and inquired at a medium in Endor. He went to a fortune teller, mind you, and he asked her to contact Samuel. And it seems that the Lord intervened and had Samuel to appear to Saul. And Samuel reminded Saul of his prior prophecy that the kingdom would be taken from him. Saul was told, at that meeting with this fortune teller, this, this medium, that you're going to lose your nation. He further told Saul that the Philistines would conquer Israel and Saul and his sons would be killed. This came to pass. Saul's sons were killed. The Philistines did indeed conquer Israel, killed all of Saul's sons, including Jonathan. And during the invasion, Saul was critically wounded 
And he told his armor bearer, take my life because I do not, he did not want the Philistines, mind you, to torment him as he knew they would. And his armor bearer feared he couldn't kill the king. So Saul took his sword and he fell on it and killed himself. And his armor bearer did the same. The lesson here, there are lessons to be learned. The first one is not to misuse the power that God has given us. The other thing that we must learn that it is most important that we obey the Lord and do his will. And lastly, as we look at the scenario, the this, this story about Saul. We must learn that God has the plan. We're to be shepherds of the flock, the mentality, the concept of whatever position he puts us in. We're the overseers. And we must do our service according to the will of God with love and compassion and patience. And not to deviate. God has the perfect plan. This is his operation. This is his business. The perfect plan. And then let's just glance at David just for a minute because David is the one with the hop and with the flute. He's the one that makes the music. He's the one with the anointing at this point in time. We find and we know that David is the author of many of the Psalms. And in them we see the way that he sought out and glorified God. He often thought of himself as being a shepherd, not high-minded, but he was humbled at his assignment. And he was a warrior poet. He was always telling God about his situation and how he perceived God to have always been there with him. And to say thank you, God, for leading and guiding and directing and protecting. He always glorified God and he gave him praise. And when he did wrong, he came before the Lord and admitted that he had done a wrong thing. And please, God, forgive me. He kept nurturing and trying to keep his relationship whole and intact with God. And that's what we should be doing, always trying our very best to please God and keep an open relationship with him and talk with him and share with him. Even our weakness, even our failures, our stumbles and, 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 and our trips and our falls, we should go before God and Lord, I could have if I should have. Lead me to that rock that is higher than I. And then finally, we look at Ephesians, the second chapter, verses one through six, and it's just a, a, a few written words there by Paul, but he says, you were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of the world, following the rule of the powers of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. We're talking about before and after. Because before with Saul, Saul was tall, dark, and handsome, looking great and grand. And he was king, and he had the spirit of God at his advantage. That was it before. But then he began to make his own decisions. And he began to crumble. And God took his spirit away from him. Now what good does it give him to be tall, dark, and handsome, looking good, and being king? And even being wealthy, to gain all world and lose his soul. He found no peace without the spirit of God. Regardless as to what he had to, to offer in terms of the spotlight. He was almost on the brink of insanity all the time because the Spirit of God wasn't there. When we're not in the, the, the place of safety with the Spirit of God dwelling in us and operating through us and about us, we're always on the edge. We're always unhappy. We're, we're pushy. We're snappy. We're short-tempered. We're moody. We're always searching for a stimulant to, to calm us. What brings calmness in our life is the love and the peace of God. I always ask God, just as David did, do not take your Holy Spirit from me. And here we find that, that Paul is telling us there was a time when you were dead through your trespasses. That was before. And, and, and you were dead in your sins. That was before. In which you once lived following the course of the world. That was before following the ruler of the powers of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desire of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. That was before. 
before we were driven by our fleshly desires. And flesh is sensational. Flesh is never satisfied. Flesh is always wanting attention. Flesh wants more, more, more. If it sleeps, it wants more sleep. If it eats, it wants more food. If it drinks, it wants more drink. If it's fleshy, it wants more sex. It just wants, wants. It finds no satisfaction. But God, ah, that's the part of the scripture that I like here in the fourth verse. It says, but God, whenever you see but God, you mean, you know there's a spiritual intervention. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of great love with which he loved, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace. We have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places of Christ Jesus. That's where we are. We have that anointing. We have that spirit of God with us. Before, it clearly says that we were captive by our sins. Flesh was driving us mad. Our hair wasn't right. We had to have the, the latest in fashion and trends. We, we were buffing and exercising, trying, trying to fit the mold. Non-stop with this fleshy thing. Oh, but now we're in heavenly places with God because the Spirit of God is with us. Sin brings death. Paul called many people who were physically alive dead because sin and Satan rule their lives. That's nothing new. That's happening today. Sin and Satan rule people's lives. Those who submit and can't get a grip and grab onto God and allow God to penetrate their lives and to live and operate and to be persuaded by the words of God, and to receive those words by faith. Oh, it is a wonderful thing. We know the true quality life, the eternal life God intended for us to have. He'll give us to know that. Life apart from Christ is death. You existing, you're not living. Apart from Christ, life is is death. The living sin is spiritually dead. Death comes by following society's habits dominated by Satan. Sin is fulfilling selfish desires. Sin is living under God's wrath. Life comes only in Christ. Who does not want to be in Christ? Satan has power with our world, but not in eternity. We're talking about the before and after. Oh, I can only say that cast all your anxiety on God because he cares for us. Be uh, self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in the faith. Stand firm on the word of God. Because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. We're not alone at this. We've been told that there will be suffering. But we're overcomers. God has given us to overcome. We know the end of the story. There's victory at the end. Count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation. Read the word and stand on the word, meaning hold true to the word. Remind yourself of what God says. And the God of grace who called us to his eternal glory in Christ. After we have suffered a little while, we'll... Himself, he says, restore us and make us strong and firm and steadfast. If we would just hold on, that was we can't. That was the before. But after, after walking into a relationship with God, and we are anointed and heirs to His kingdom, who can take that from us unless we give it away? Oh, how much different Saul's life would have turned out to be had he obeyed God to the fullest? He would have been a prime example of a king. He would have been the pattern that would have been established for the kings to come after him. Oh, but rather his disobedience left him in a sad mental state in spite of his physique and his looks. Huh. What good was that without the power of God? I would just say that Tell the world about your before and after stories. Let them know that you once was lost, but now you're found. Tell the world your before and after stories, that you were blind, but now you see. 
Would you please tell the world your before and after stories that you were sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. But then God gave you a lifeline and brought you in. Tell the world your before and after stories. What a prodigal son and daughter you once were, but you returned home to your father. And there he embraced you. Tell the world your before and after stories. What a rebel you had become, a chief among sinners, but you are now redeemed and bought with the price. Jesus has changed your whole life. Tell somebody, will you? Your before and after story. Surely it'll be a blessing. It'll be a blessing to the one that hears it. It'll be a blessing to the one who perceives it and understands it. It'll be a blessing to someone in their heart. Their heart of, of, of a stone will become a heart of flesh. Try it. Try it and see how many people like hearing your story of before and after. I thank you. To God be the glory for the things that he has said and for the many things that he has done and will do. Tell your before and after stories. God bless you.